Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, so in continuation of ENT examination, we will examine throat today. Throat is a common layman term. Technically, which will be included in throat is the examination of oral cavity, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Okay, again, that famous quote that eyes don't see which brain doesn't know. Okay, so if you have a clear cut knowledge of anatomy and physiology, then you would be able to pick up abnormalities. So, we will start with the examination of the oral cavity. Now, oral cavity, just like nasal cavity, it is again divided into two parts. Oral cavity are the mouth. These two terms are synonymously used. And oral cavity are the mouth. It is divided into oral vestibule and oral cavity proper. So, oral vestibule is that part which is bounded anteriorly by the lips and posteriorly by the upper and lower teeth and upper and lower jaw and then from upper and lower jaw upper gingivolabial fold then cheek mucosa and lower gingivolabial fold and then lower jaw along with the teeth so these are the boundaries of the oral vestibule and oral cavity proper is basically that part which is there behind the upper and lower jaw along with their teeth. So oral cavity proper will be basically, anteriorly will be the teeth. On the sides also there will be the teeth and jaw if someone is edentulous. Roof will be formed by hard palate. Hard palate only. Soft palate is not included in oral cavity. Soft palate is included in oropharynx. And then floor of the mouth. Floor of the mouth is formed by no, no, that is a very basic misconception. Floor of the mouth is formed by mylohyde muscle. Tongue is the content of the oral cavity, you can say. That is, floor of the mouth is formed by the mylohyde muscle. And posteriorly, this oral cavity is continuous with the oropharynx through what we call as oropharyngeal isthmus. Then, in the cheek mucosa, which salivary gland opens? Parotid duct opens there at the level of second against upper second molar. Upper second molar against that. So when we have to examine, keeping all these things in mind, because if we know that where exactly the parotid duct opens, then we will see any you know blockage or any you know congestion or any inflammation there we will look for. Okay, so keeping in mind briefly the anatomy of the oral cavity, we start again. So again. First is the intro, then this is a simulated patient, one of your colleagues of course, just he has volunteered. So consent of the patient is there, then is position, position as I told you is the same, that his legs will be on one side, my legs will be on other side, never sit with cross legs. And last is the exposure, this time exposure is must because in uh, examination of you can say throat, the complete neck examination will be there. With reference to ear and nose, we just, uh, you know, examined the lymph nodes of the neck. But this time, we have to examine the neck as a whole. When I say as a whole, means laryngotracheal framework we also have to look for. There may be thyroid abnormalities or thyroid problems may be there. So we have to look for all that, those things. We will come to that later on. So starting with the oral cavity now, just observe that what happens clinically when we are in there in the clinics immediately the patient comes with some throat problems even attendant for example if it is a child especially the parents will ask the child open the mouth and take your tongue out it is not like that secondly when the patient comes our colleagues what they do ask the patient to open the mouth and immediately thrust the the tongue depressor into the mouth it is not like that you will see there are so many steps before the use of actually the tongue depressor to depress the tongue okay so again the inspection inspection will start from as i told you the lips so when you are going for the lips lips you will see any cracking their color for example if a patient is severely dehydrated there will be you know cracks of the mucous membrane then color of the mucous membrane any angular stromatitis for example in an anemic patient may be there so so much information will be available just by looking at the lips okay so just ask the patient 
to open the mouth and look for everything whatever roof for the hard palate cheek mucosa and the tongue in its normal anatomical position so you have asked the patient to touch the hard palate with the tip of tongue so that you can see the ventral surface of the tongue and you can see the floor of the mouth which salivary glands open in the floor of the mouth sub mandibular duct and sublingual salivary glands they open there then you have to look for patient may be having ankyloglossia which is a tongue tie and then ventral surface of the tongue now you can see for example if a patient is having a ranula which is a retention cyst of the sublingual glands if it is there in the floor of the mouth and you immediately just press the tongue you are going to miss that if there is an abnormality of the submandibular duct you are going to miss that isn't it so that's the importance of then you take the tongue depressor okay and still we are to the oral vestibule so how to start with this you will retract the cheek and you will see upper gingivo labial fold then cheek mucosa especially with reference to parotid duct opening against the upper second molar lower gingivo labial folds under surface of the inner surface of the lips lower lip on this side now again the cheek mucosa especially with reference to parotid duct opening upper gingivo labial folds and inner surface of the lip so this is how you will look for very smoothly very gently you will rotate all around and you see the pole of the oral vestibule in some books it is written you can use two tongue depressors simultaneously but with two tongue depressors it looks very odd as you are going to tear the oral cavity of the patient so once you have done this one then you will go for the depressing the tongue and looking for the oropharynx so i depress the tongue when depressing the tongue tongue should be there inside the oral cavity because if patient protrudes the tongue what will happen there will be a bulge of the tongue base of the tongue will be forward and with bulge of the tongue you would not be able to see the posterior pharyngeal wall in the oropharynx okay so tongue should be there in normal anatomical position and gently you will push the depress the anterior two third of the tongue and you will be looking for the oropharynx in the oropharynx you know in the lateral wall there will be palatine tonsils then posterior pharyngeal wall you have to look for soft palate and at the same time you noticed i asked the patient to say ah when the patient says ah the soft palate moves because i have to check the movement of the soft palate as i told you repeatedly that not only anatomically we have to check it we have to check the functions of that particular area also so when we see, ask the patient to say ah and there is movement of the soft palate and the uvula which cranial nerve is being checked glossopharyngeal so that is the ninth cranial nerve we are checking ultimately once we would have finished the ent examination you will see all the 12 cranial nerves will be examined during ent examination so that it will help you out in medicine also in pediatrics also in neurological uh, examination of the patient in any specialty so we have seen the oropharynx now we are left with the laryngopharynx so laryngopharynx it cannot be you know examined while uh, directly so again just like posterior rhinoscopy for the nasopharyngeal examination we have to use a mirror this time the mirror will be called as indirect laryngoscopy mirror idl indirect laryngoscopy indirect because we will see again the light will be reflected and it will be you know from the mirror downwards larynx will be lit up and we will see the image of the larynx here in the mirror so indirectly we are visualizing the larynx so that's why it is called as indirect laryngoscopy mirror while do under general anesthesia in the operation theater we use direct laryngoscope there we are directly visualizing the larynx okay so this is called indirect laryngoscopy mirror last time in posterior rhinoscopy we used this mirror the difference between the two i mentioned on that day as well that this posterior rhinoscopy mirror has got a step this is because we have to look upwards 
because nasophy nasophenics is upwards so when we will hold it our own hump of our hand will hamper our view but this time again we will be going through the oral cavity and oropharynx but this time the larynx will be downwards so we have to hold it so this time our hand is not obscuring our view so there is no need of any stem there so this is with straight okay again different sizes you know different sizes of the mirrors are available and this area you can see rest of it is smooth this is rough area so that it does not slip from our hands thirdly you have to hold it like a pen most of the instruments in ent you have to hold like a pen whether it is otoscope whether this is uh, during surgery uh, tonsillar dissector whether it is freer's elevator during septal surgeries are this these mirrors whether it is posterior rhinoscopy mirror or indirect laryngoscopy mirror you have to hold it like a pen again the problem will be with the fogging so for fogging as i have told you if we have got the anti fogging solution we can use that otherwise you have to go for this spirit lamp and as i told you its outer invisible portion is the hottest one so you will just warm it not hot it just warm it while keeping it from mirror side just at the outer invisible portion you will not go into the flame because if you go into the flame it will blacken the mirror okay never heat it from metallic side if metallic side dilates this mirror may fall down so once you have you know warm it then check it on the back of your hand it will give the confidence to the patient as well because otherwise it is horrifying for the patient that you are warming something and then putting it in his mouth like that now the difference between posterior rhinoscopy and this indirect laryngoscopy first thing is between the mirror okay there the mirror is with the step this one is there there we have asked the patient to breathe through the through the nose because when he is breathing through the nose the soft uh, soft palate descends down and nasopharynx opens up here we have to examine the throat this laryngopharynx so here we will ask the patient to breathe through the mouth because when he will be breathing through the mouth soft palate will move upwards and more space will be available for examination thirdly this time we will have to ask the patient to protrude the tongue because when the patient protrudes the tongue larynx comes up so when it comes up it is becomes a bit easy to look at the image of the larynx in the so so patient will be sitting straight with spine straight neck a bit forward breathing through the mouth and tongue out when tongue out we have to hold it with a gauze piece the purpose of gauze piece is first thing is that ideally you should have gloves because you should not for your safety is the priority so you you should not soil your hands with the secretions of the patient at any stage you have to hold the tongue with the, the gauze piece the reason being that tongue should not soil your hand first thing second thing the tongue should not slip from your hands and thirdly the tongue because it is being protruded as you will see practically also it may be pressed against the lower incisors so lower incisors can injure the lower surface of the ventral surface of the tongue so we have to guide against that okay so this is just we will warm it outer invisible portion we will check it on the back of our hand aapne seedhe aise seedhe so you can see i have guarded the lower surface of the tongue against the lower incisors then i will hold it like this i will retract the upper limb i will check it and i will go inside at the base of the uvula and then i will see the structures say t was it t e so you see tongue is being protected from lower incisors and i have asked the patient to say a ah, or e to see the vocal cord movements so when we see the vocal cord movements which cranial nerve is being checked sorry vagus nerve 10th cranial nerve okay so during indirect laryngoscopy from above below which structures will come you see while examining the oral cavity and oropharynx we saw the uh, this uh, 
dorsal and ventral surfaces of the anterior two thirds of the tongue, but we would not be able to see the base of the tongue, isn't it? Because tongue is like that. Okay. So when we have gone for the, so first of all, what we, structures we will see base of the tongue. Then just tilt it like that. Then we will see vellicula along with median and lateral glossoepiglottic folds, and then will come the lingual surface of the epiglottis tip of the epiglottis and lingual surface of the epiglottis. Then just we move and then we see the laryngeal inlet in which there will be retinoid cartilages, epiglottic folds, then we will see retinoids and below will be the supraglottis. In supraglottis we will see the false cords, we will see the true vocal cords. So we have to go look for any secretions, any ulceration, any mass, if mass is there, characteristics of mass, whether it is, you know, ulcerated or congested or over surface is smooth or not, at which site it is there. And then we ask the patient to say, ah, are you to see the vocal cords are meeting in midline or not. Then below that, in some patients, especially in older patients, you can see the subglottic region as well. Okay. Still, with indirect laryngoscopy, so many structures of the larynx and sideways because on the sideways we will see the piriform fossa as well so many structures of this laryngopharynx are not visible those hidden areas are difficult areas to be examined on those includes how many surfaces for epiglottis which one lingual surface and larynx so lingual surface we because the cartilage this uh, epiglottis is like this hanging over the larynx so we can see this lingual surface but this laryngeal surface will be difficult to look for so laryngeal surface of the epiglottis is difficult then between true and vocal cords is the vestibule so whole of the vestibule it is difficult to look for piriform fossa opening we can see but the apex of the piriform fossa will not be visible with this one then post cricoid area is also not visible on so for that we have to go for direct laryngoscopy. So this is the laryngeal examination and hypopharynx, of course, the part of the hypopharynx. Then we come to the neck. As I told you, this time in neck, we have to go in detail. Again, that will be the inspection. When I say inspection, but in inspection, you know, you have to go for the color, whether it is normal or not, then any ulcerations. If some swelling is there, the general surgery people, they will tell you site, size, shape, overlying skin, number, any ulceration, any vascularization over that, etc. like this. About swelling, you have to note, uh, note. Then, any scar, because if patient has gone under surgery before, so there will be, scars will be there. So you have to look for those scars also. As far as neck is concerned, any swelling in the midline, which moves on swallowing, that is related with our own protruding of the tongue that is related with thyroid or thyroglossal duct okay so any swelling in the midline which moves on swallowing or on protruding of the tongue that is related with thyroid or thyroglossal duct cyst okay so you have to examine like this you have to look for then ask the patient to swallow and see the movement okay then you will go for palpation. In palpation, again, just ask the patient if he or she feels pain, just let you know. And you, because patient may have come with some laryngeal trauma in road traffic accident or after strangulation in some assault case like that. So there may be laryngeal. So you have to look for any laryngeal crepitus is there. This uh, laryngeal framework is intact or not, okay? Because this Adam's apple is prominent. If some, you know, injury from the front, it may be flattened like that. And at the same time, you have to look for what we call as, what do you call it? Laryngeal crepitus. What is laryngeal crepitus? Crepitus is present because the laryngeal structures, they are moving against the vertebral column. If something comes in between larynx and vertebral column, then this laryngeal crepitus will be absent. And typically, this is absent in case of post cricoid carcinoma. When the mass is there, typical sign of the laryngeal crepitus will be absent. Then you have to go for in the midline, you have to palpate it. Then you have to look for the 
position of the trachea, whether it is in the midline or it is shifted to either side, you will put this index and this ring finger over the sternomedial end of the sternoclavicular joint. You put it there and then you can feel whether trachea is there inside or not. Okay? Then examination, if uh, you feel that there is some problem with the, it is for example with trauma or something like that, you have to check for alamut cranial nerve, you have to check for the sternocleidomastoid and uh, this uh, trapezius muscles. Okay, for that you know, and whenever the function of the muscles, you have to check it out. That is always against resistance. Because when nerve is involved, it may not be completely paralyzed. There may be paresis. Or to start with, still some function of the muscles will be restored. But against resistance, it will not be possible. So for accessory nerve, just to tell you that like this, that just force the shoulder and ask the patient to shrug up the shoulders. Okay, and then ask the patient to check them. So against resistance, you can, you know, palpate the sternocleidomastoid whether they become taut or not. Okay, that, that is again the same that you will stand up, you will go behind the patient, first you will go for superficial palpations and then you will go for deep palpations with the pulp of your fingers, again submental, submental, upper deep cervical, then this pre-auricular, post-auricular, you ask the patient to flex the neck along the interior border of sternocleidomastoid middle, deep cervical, lower deep cervical, you come in the midline pre-tracheal, pre-laryngeal lymph nodes at the same time with the help of your thumb for sub-occipital lymph nodes and then you go for supraglavicular lymph nodes. Okay? Thank you very much.